Powered by Rep Media in partnership with TSN, it is Season 5, and this is Episode 6 of the Rain Rakes Hockey Podcast, presented by our title sponsors, Canadian Club Whiskey. Introducing the first release, Rave, the Canadian Club Invitation Series, CC 15-year-old Sherry Cass. So it's the signature CC Classic 12-year-old whiskey finished with a secondary aging in Oloroso Sherry Cass. All the hallmarks of Canadian Club whiskey with the added richness and sweetness of sherry. Uh, so we were supposed to have Cole Caulfield on the podcast uh, this week, episode six. Unfortunately for Cole, I mean, we always have a lineup of guests. Unfortunately for Cole, something mm-hmm. came up, so he's not able to join us. That's fine. Marty Baron, longtime hockey analyst, great sense of humor and personality. Uh, great he's- storyteller. Great storyteller. He's going to pinch hit. He'll join us here in episode six. So you're in Washington. It's Friday morning as yep. uh, we record episode six of Ray and Regs. What's the day off like for Ray Ferraro in, in Washington? You bounce around the White House. Like what goes down there? Yeah, I went I went for a walk down there and, um, you know, it's pretty amazing. I mean, we see it on TV all the time and just to go walk down in that area. And it's it was a beautiful day, like yeah. just spectacular day. So I was gone for a couple hours. I, I don't know, worked out and watched the ball game last night, actually, which was phenomenal. I love playoff baseball. And so I watched the Phillies and the Braves and had a good dinner. And, you know, good oh, got a, got, a, got a new watch battery. You know, that was a big, oh, big highlight. Well, that's of important. Day. That's important. Yeah, you know, well, especially because I was always late because the other one wasn't working. So yeah. I guess I could use the one on my phone, but I just felt like, you know, I should start wearing this watch that I have that I don't even know how long I've had it that I don't wear. So I just decided yeah. to. Do you wear a watch? I don't, and and, and I, I've got. I wouldn't say a high end collection of watches. You know, I'm not a Rolex guy or a Tag guy or any of that. But I, I have three or four nice watches. Right, one of them was a gift from Holly, and I don't know if it's just the laziness or I don't wear a wedding ring either, which. Polly doesn't care one way or another. It's that I don't like stuff on my hands or on my wrist. So my iPhone well, that, is my, that would is my that watch. would take that would take away a ring and a watch right there. Yeah, those, yeah those right are, there. So <laughs> why you yeah, want to so buy anyways, one? No, I got I got one. That's plenty. I, I wasn't <laughs> even wearing that one. So um, and so today's uh, Washington's first game. They're yeah. they're dying to get at it. They've been sitting around here all week, and Pittsburgh's in, and of course they didn't have a very good start either so they lose their first game so Ovi and Sid Oof. game I think it's 68 or something for them it's Always really fun. kind of a mar- remarkable so that's today hey Canada Tim's NHL trading cards are back with the all new set so get ready to unpack the thrill score your favorite hockey stars grab them before they're gone hot commodity no doubt about that they're available now only at Tim's and it is time, Ray, for the Tim Hortons headlines. And why don't we dive right into the deep stuff to start, right? So the debacle of the week involving the NHL and the National Hockey League Players Association is the restriction of pride tape, right? And we knew that there was something coming from the NHL because of the reaction of the players who chose not to wear the commemorative sweater in warm-up recognizing Pride Nights across the national. Yes, hockey. last year. Last year. Last season. Weren't yeah. that many. And it it was an annoyance to me, and this is just me, because I kept thinking, why is this earning so much attention? Yeah, I mean, these guys should be held accountable. They should, you know, be asked the questions and be allowed to answer how they see fit as to why they're not wearing that sweater. But we're losing focus because We're not acknowledging the 650 players that happily support the community and whatnot. So that was that was an annoyance of mine last year. It feels now like it's an overreaction by the NHL. However, the NHLPA, who has been silent in this process, right, did approve the memo that was drafted by the National Hockey League before it was sent out. And it does include a restriction on pride tape the use of pride tape in practices and in games. So is this an over-the-top reaction by the NHL and the Players Association for the small percentage of players who, for whatever their reasons are, personal reasons, refuse to support the LGBTQ community? 
I, I was I, I still don't quite get it. I don't I don't get what the point is of of banning the pride tape if I I, I mean I I I'm I'm with you like if the guy doesn't want to wear the jersey well then he goes out there and answers why he doesn't want to wear the jersey. Um so they they've basically changed the entire policy for seven guys which <laughs> I think was the was the number last year. Yeah. Um there there's been some really thoughtful answers I think from the players who who have been asked about it um about okay if if you can tell us what we can't do, well, why can't we do this? Mm-hmm. So there's a, I, I, sus- I suspect there's a great many players that will use pride tape this year. And I hope what so. are you get? Yeah. But it's hard. I think people have to understand, like it's, it's just as hard for them to use the tape, not knowing, okay, so what's coming down the road. If I do Yeah, is like, I can't believe you. Would you get fined? Would you get suspended? That would be ridiculous. Yeah. It would be ridiculous. If a player, I, I hope players will be able to, um, to just take the step and say, yeah, you know what? I'm, yeah. I'm going to use the tape. You know, Scott Lawton has been, a um, a, at the forefront, uh, of a supporter of, of the, the pride nights and the pride tape and, and support and allyship and all that. He really has been. And yeah. I, he said he's going to use it at, you know, he's going to use the tape, but it's not only that it's the, those nights have been wiped out across the board. It, it's not just pride night. It's correct. It's everything. Yeah. I, I mean, there will be acknowledgements, right? <laughs> There'll be jumbotron and acknowledgements. There'll be, you know, support shown in other methods, just okay, not what with about, the what sweaters. About, yeah. Okay. But what about like, um, hockey fights cancer? Yeah. Same. Like, does that night yeah. go away? Yeah. Like that, that this makes wearing no of the sweater, I believe does. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I, I support, I support the players want to do this uh i do think the players association um you know i mean you 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 have to support this yeah well you don't i guess you don't have to but you you should you really should and this the pride tape to me is is an easy one and is one that 100 percent yeah should be allowed i just do i i just i can't support the nhl's position on that well, and before you approve it, do you not pick up the phone or canvas the players? I mean, this is an important personal decision individually for each player. They sure. should have a say in the outcome. <clears throat> there, there is, there's. The, you said it. It's a, per, a personal decision. Yeah. And if players want to use the tape, they should use the tape. Agreed. Agreed. If they want to support publicly. Support publicly. Yeah. 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 And good luck. Imagine what the reaction is going to be if. There's something punitive applied when Scott Lawton or a number of players embrace. All right, uh, onto the ice. Connor Bedard, you had a front row seat for his <clears> NHL <throat> debut, yep. right? How fun was that? I, I, I mean, number one, just just tell us what your impression was because look, we talked about Bedard. We've talked about him on the podcast a number of times before we saw him in his first regular right. season game. It, it, was he better? than what you expected he could be. And we know he's going to get a lot better as he evolves in the game. I wouldn't say better. I think I was most impressed by his demeanor. Um, He didn't look flustered. The only time he looked flustered was when he couldn't find his stick. And I, when he was coming out, I, I don't know this, but I'm guessing at about a 99 and a half (laughs) percent. Okay. That, he puts his stick, he said, he puts his stick in an area where the blade is up so it doesn't touch the ground, and he puts it in a spot. When he walks out, he grabs it. Guaranteed somebody moved it just because. Yeah, just to, to, to jerk just around to be, with the kid. Yeah, just to be a little That's beefy. awesome. And then he came out, and you saw he turns around three or four places. It's not there, and he runs out. That was the only time he looked <laughs> flustered to me in the night. But – his ability to get his shot away, to 
carry the puck through the yeah. middle of the ice. None of that he looked flustered by. There is junior hockey still in his game. Like there was a couple times near a part of the shift when it was probably too much. He yeah. still tried to beat guys and he'll learn that. That'll mm-hmm. that'll come. But but I I think this is I like he's not McDavid. Like you know what I what I think I saw is in that first game, and it's one game, and then the next night he scored in Boston and played 22 minutes each night, yeah, yeah. is that Bedard separates himself from most of the rookies in the league. But there's also a separation from where he is to McDavid and Matthews and the players of, of that ilk. Sure. And McDavid separates himself further. Yeah. You know, but none of that is a slight on Connor Bedard. It's that... I don't see a time when he's Connor McDavid. I just don't. Yeah. I see a time where he's going to score 50 goals. Hmm. I still think 30 goals is going to be plenty this year. Because just just think I of agree how, with that. You know, just think like so they lose Taylor Hall for week to week and whatever that means, right? Like that that means they don't have a timeline yet on. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> one of their better offensive players is gone. So now it's harder to create more. And, and, I, and that's just one example of like the power play is not going to be 32%. The power play is going to be 17% or 18%. Mm-hmm. You know, so like there's only so much offense there. Uh, I thought it was great to watch the excitement nice. uh, around his opening. And I was really happy that he was able to get on the board in his, you know, his first two games. So we've got Marty Baron joining us on the podcast. So we'll talk about the Buffalo signings with with Marty, right? A couple mm. of key ones, clearly, in Rasmus Dahlin and, and Owen Power. They get into long-term contracts. Excellent work by Kevin Adams, the general manager. A couple of games I want to touch on here in the Tim Hortons headlines, right? The Canucks disemboweled the Oilers. Every once in a while, I get to use that word, and I love Yeah, it. that was a surprising word. Yeah, there you go. Disemboweled the Oilers, 8-1. Four goals for Brock Besser, five points for JT Miller. Uh, Pedersen looked terrific to me. He did. In that yeah. game. He did, including the big hit on Cody Cece, which I think surprised a lot of people, maybe everyone included. But man, let's start with, with Petey. If Pedersen is going to play that way on a continued basis, which I think is fair to expect, right? He mm-hmm. is going to be a superstar in the NHL. He's probably budding right there right now yeah so 100 points last year i think he's going to get 100 points this year just think of how many people get 100 points yeah yeah like i i have him projected at 100 points again he's even though you know i hate this term dregs he's a 200 foot player (laughs) yes he plays you know he plays in every situation for them he kills penalties he's he's a, a ferocious competitor yeah. Even though he doesn't show a lot of um, emotion on the ice, <laughs> he's he's going to have a big year. He he really is. And so the night couldn't have gone much more perfectly for Vancouver, other than Thatcher Demko throwing up in his mask, <laughs> and it couldn't have gone much worse for the Edmonton Oilers from top um, to bottom, right? Top to bottom. Yeah. But you know, the thing that stood out the most to me for the Oilers is that I know people are looking at the goalies is what the loss of Matthias Ekholm is on that blue line. Like that is, that's not like all dominoes are the same size. Ginormous. And uh, you know, his, his absence, uh, honestly, I I thought cascaded through that defense Yeah, and they need him. That's, that's for certain. And by the way, it's one game and you just flush it, right? I mean, that's one that you just, Forget him. You know what? It's actually probably better to lose like that in an 82 game season than to have a lingering problem that keeps poking its head up all the time and right. you haven't fixed it. I mean, that game stunk. Mm. They were bad and they'll be miles better on Saturday. Wild game in Toronto, the Montreal Canadiens and the Maple Leafs on Wednesday. <laughs> the Leafs win that one in a shootout, six to five. Austin Matthews with a hat trick. That would have been a game. The coaches, both coaches, Marty St. Louis, Sheldon Keefe would have hated 
<laughs> like it was, it was porous, you know, bad yeah, start know. by the Leafs. Montreal jumps to the two nothing lead. Uh, but from an entertainment perspective, come on, I, you know, we don't see a lot of fighting in the game anymore. This wasn't two heavyweights going hard at it, like swapping haymakers in, in Arbor Jack Eye and Ryan Reeves, but they fought and the upstart Jack Eye found a way to, to throw Reeves down to the, so he'd had the elements Mm-hmm. of an entertaining hockey game. So if you're the Montreal Canadiens, do you look at a moral victory in this by pulling out a point in the shootout? Or do you look at the obvious and the the, the lead changes and, and all of those things? And then conversely, if you're the Leafs, there's some work that needs to get done to tidy things up. Yeah, I think both teams will look at it and go, well, that was one game and let's hope we don't play 81 more like that. Yeah. You know, like it was, it was fun to watch. It was... Um, it's amazing where momentum changes. It was two nothing. Caulfield scores on the power play. It gets taken back for um, um, for the offside. Offside, yeah. And and then I think the Leafs outshot them fourteen to two or fourteen to one the rest of the period. And um, but, you know, uh, I don't I don't know that I don't know moral victories. Whatever. I I think Montreal it just looks at this year about what growth are they going to have from now. Mm-hmm. until November, until March. Like, what's their growth timeline look like? And that's really the most important thing for them. I mean, they've got some really good young players. And How about young Newhook? Nice start yeah. for him, eh? Well, so I, Newhook's a, is, I think he's really interesting to look at as you think about your favorite team around the league. Every team runs into this is that you put time into a young player and then they get stuck. Yeah. Like, Newhook looked, in in Colorado, he just looked stuck. He did, and he's in, got new sets of eyes and new sets of expectations when he goes to Montreal, and he's got a better chance to be the player he's going to be there than what was going to happen in Colorado. He was, yeah. And sometimes guys just, I don't, I don't know how to explain it. You just get stuck. The yeah. the team sees what you aren't, as opposed to what you could be, and then you're stuck because yeah. you know what they know. And the player can't get out of the mud. I'll but tell he he looked terrific the other night, and yeah. um, and that's uh, that's a good move for a good bet for Montreal to make. That, that top six might surprise some teams, right? I mean that that line with Newhook and Slavkovsky, he looks like he's evolving. Yep. Kirby Doc, big dude, and then yep. you've got Josh Anderson, the power forward, with Caulfield and and Suzuki. We'll see. They they may not be as. Do you know what I always think of? With Josh Anderson, I think of like a buffalo running downhill. <laughs> Every time I watch him play, it's like he when he gets going, you're like, well, how are you going to get in front of that? Like, how no, are you? Oh boy, he just like he's so. I don't know. I just I'm entertained watching him play because I think he's I think he's really good. Yeah, me and, too. And yeah, and he's just a moose, man. He just. <laughs> He's so big. <laughs> That's a great way to describe it. Outstanding. Those are Tim Horton's headlines. Tim's NHL trading cards are back. Unpack the thrill. Score your favorite icons with an all-new set. Get yours before they're gone. Only at Tim's. Our interviews on Ray and Dregs are brought to us by Canadian Club Whiskey. Introducing the first release of the Canadian Club Invitation Series, CC 15-year-old Sherry Cask. All the hallmarks of classic Canadian club with the added richness and sweetness of Sherry. All right, joined on the Ray and Dregs Hockey Podcast by a longtime friend of both of ours, Ray, and a friend to Ray and Dregs, and that's Marty Baron, who is uh, an analyst with the Buffalo Sabres, longtime analyst with TSN, and he's got those sparkling, beautiful Blue eyes. I mean, if 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 you don't follow Ray and Dreg's YouTube channel, this is the reason why, right? So you can get a real up close look at those. Get a uh, get a glimpse at those things. Those are. I should have put my glasses on. I should have been putting my sunglasses on. You know, it's early in the morning. They look yeah. tired. Sabers had a game last night. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but okay, I, I'm ready to go. Did they have a game last night? Because it didn't look like they showed up for the home opener, did it? Uh, no, they had a pregame ceremony that was awesome. They had a party in the plaza. They dedicated a uh, a section of the um, 
the street around the building to uh, regenerate. So it's called the RJ Way. The nice. fans were buzzing. And then Alex Lafreniere scored three minutes in and that took everything out. And nobody, nobody really uh, wanted to uh, have fun after that. Hmm. Marty, what's the, what's the excite? You know, you, you paint that opening day picture, but what's the general excitement in Buffalo? It seems like most people have the Sabres either in or right at a playoff spot again. It's the first time there really seems this great enthusiasm in Buffalo. Um, what's it like there, and, and what are people expecting? It's been awesome. The whole summer was, you know, the team was so fun to watch last year, and Tage Thompson got 47 goals, and Rasmus Dallin and Owen Power, and now you got the contracts, right, for Dallin and mm -hmm. Power. And, and then there's a young kid, the first pick this year first round pick for the Sabres Zach Benson he's making the team he's it's fun to watch so there's so much excitement they're still the youngest team in the NHL when you look at the opening day roster mm -hmm. and it was funny because Don Granado yesterday said hey you know I told my guys young is getting old like we're not young anymore like Rasmus dallin has been in the league like five mm -hmm. years he's not young and despite being young full but he's not young in the NHL we're not young anymore um, they did look young in game one, uh, but that's going to, you know, they're going to work it out. But there's a lot of excitement. Uh, the the players themselves, not just for what they do on the ice, but they're so good in the community. Um, and there's such a connectivity with, with everything. I mean, Damar Hamlin banged the drum before the game yesterday. Mm -hmm. Josh Allen's in the stands. Like, there's a buzz when it comes to sports in Buffalo. And for the longest time, it wasn't there. The Bills didn't make the playoffs for 12 years or whatever it was. It was longer than that, I think. And then the Sabres, it's been 12, but um, now there's a buzz with both teams. When, when you look at the roster and you, you know, all these young guys that, you know, Darlene and power and Samuelson and Thompson and cousins have all been signed six and seven and eight years out. Um, it gives great hope, but it also makes me feel a little bit like, are, are they really quite ready to take the step or is it just that young is old and yeah, they're ready now. Um, I think they are ready. Uh, look, Dylan cousins last year had a breakout season after he went to the world championship with team Canada and looked really good. Right. And then he just took ownership. I think this year that guy is JJ Paterka. He had a good year last year and then he went and played for Germany, at the world championship and, and really looked good. And I feel, okay, that's the next step. One thing that hurts is the Jack Quinn injury. I mean, he, he hurt his Achilles in the summertime. He probably won't be back until Christmas. Um, that left a hole, and that hole needs to be filled. And is it Victor Olofsson? Is it Zach Benson? Is it Matt Savoy when he comes back healthy? Is it somebody else? Is it Patrick Kane? Who knows, right? Maybe the Sabres go out and acquire somebody if they don't have a good start. Um, so there's a lot of pressure on the players on the roster. There's a lot of pressure on Kevin Adams to make sure that he's identified the right core and that they're going to be successful. When I was here in Buffalo, you know, for many years, uh, it was older veterans. You know, we had mm. the Stu Barnes and the Miro Chatans and those guys. And then they made a decision to go with the Briere and Drury. And uh, Tepo Newman was there. And then it became Ryan Meller. And then they moved away from that core. And they gave it to Pominville, Vanek, Roy, Brian Campbell. And... Look, it was good, but it didn't have the success that Drury and Briere did. That's what is hard for a GM is identifying the core. So now Kevin's identified identified those five guys. You know, Thompson, Cousins, Dallin, Samuelson, Power, and then you have Tuck and Skinner, and you have a lot of other pieces. But if it doesn't start well, then there's going to be a lot of pressure. Yeah, I mean, and and you nailed it. I mean, there's no doubt that Kevin Adams is is going to continue to try and add, and and Patty Kane is an intriguing piece. We'll see where that goes in the next several weeks. But give us your assessment of the goaltending. I mean, that looks pretty good in Buffalo as well, and and in a developing way with that group and uh, age sensitive. Yeah, I mean, Devin Levi's 21 years old, and <laughs> yeah. look, last year they threw him to the Wolves, right? Come on in out of Northeastern, and we're in a playoff race, and we're going to play you every game, and he was 5-2. and two. I said in a small sample last year, you know, you look at his stats, and you look at his advanced metrics, and goal save above expectations, he'd have been top 10 in the league if he'd have played 42 games in the season. Well, he played seven games, so small sample, yeah. but he could be that guy. He could be a very solid number one goaltender, um, 
it's just it's it's unknown if you know playing 82 games in a season or playing two games a week in college is completely different so that is a a question mark but i think devin levi for the future is going to be fantastic the one guy that i thought had a fantastic camp and he was a really solid goaltender in the nhl two years ago was eric comrie he backed up connor hellebuck in winnipeg he was absolutely like a steady goaltender, NHL goaltender in Winnipeg. And then last year he starts well as an injury, never recovered. Well, never recovered. Why? Because they had three goalies. They had Craig Anderson, Uko Pekalukunen, and him. He didn't get regular playing time and he lost his rhythm. Well, it's the same thing now. They do have three goaltenders, which I absolutely hate. Uh, <laughs> and there's five, there's four other teams in the NHL that have three goalies. And I'm like, why? Why? Because you're worried of losing one. Like yeah. you just you're not helping the other two. What are you doing? Mm-hmm. But I get it's early in the season. But I think Comrie could have a role. And Lucan is still young, but is it going to be frustrating for him to first of all be a healthy scratch now? Maybe not getting the games on early in the season, and and then you kind of lose the guy. Marty, were you surprised at all in the off season when they? You know, it was pretty clear they were uh, going to go with Levi. Certainly that they didn't didn't attempt or maybe they did attempt, but to bring in an older guy to work with them, because I would assume being a 21 year old looking at the whole season in front of you is it's a lot like it, it, you know, you're just trying to get your feet wet in the league and they're asking you to do a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It it is a lot, but then I took myself back to my playing days and I'm like, if I had been what, which I was 23, 24, right. I had Bob Asenzo with me my first year as a starter with Buffalo. I'm like, it didn't matter what goalie Bob was going to say to me. Like I had my, you know, earmuffs and, you know, blinders on and I was focusing on me. Like it just, you, you, you may want somebody to help and support, but at the same time, it, everything is so new for Devin Levi that, He's going to try to, you know, kind of work through all the information himself. So, you know, Craig Anderson was there last year and he was there in training camp and he showed up and maybe he's going to help from afar. Eric Comrie can help. Mike Bells has a ton of experience. Assistant coach, mm-hmm. goalie coach, Mike Bells has a ton of experience. There's people in place. Uh, but at the same time, you already had three goaltenders. If you bring yeah. one more, you got four now. And, you know, the goalie market was so flooded this summer that you probably would have been stuck with four. So I don't think the Sabres really had any chance uh, unless mm. you were really going to make an upgrade. And were you going to pay Connor Hellebuck eight and a half or $9 million right. a year? No, you weren't going to do that. So I think they did what they had to do is just rolling up the dice a little bit. So what's, when I look at Levi, of course, the easy, uninitiated comparison is he's the same size roughly as UC Soros in in Nashville. And every small goalie in the league should pay money to UC Soros for being so good because (laughs) now teams think, oh, hey, maybe a small guy can play goal. Like, are they the same or are they just the same size? Uh, They are very similar. They're the same size, yes. Um, and look, UC Soros, it took him a while before he established himself as a number one. He was behind Pekka Rene. I remember a lot of people telling me he'll never be a good number one goaltender. He's good as a backup, but he's too small. And over time, people will figure him out. Well, that hasn't happened. He's really good. But there is similarities in the way they play. Mm. Devin mm. Levi is very athletic, very flexible. Uh, for, for not being tall, he covers the net. Like he's very thick in the net. UC Soros is the same way. The difference between Soros and Levi right now is experience and control. Like even mm. in game one against the Rangers, I was looking at Shesterkin, who very athletic and quick and has the, the splits kind of like Levi. But Shesterkin was so under control inside of his crease at all time, you know, n- never overslid the lane. You yeah, see Soros right. is like that. Like he's got the experience right now. Devin Levi, you could see a couple of moments in the first game where he's sliding outside of the crease, outside of the net, and he's got a battle to recover. Um, he'll learn. It, he just has to put it all under control, but he has all the ability and all the tools. Marty Buran joining us on the Rain Dregs Hockey Podcast. Marty, take us across the league. I mean, have you identified some goalie hot spots, you know, areas that we as insiders should be paying attention to where GMs might want to upgrade or change things up? Well, I mean, a lot of GMs probably want to upgrade and then they probably think, well, let's not overreact. And, you know, we we have our salary cap and, 
you know, we have to deal with it. The Edmonton Oilers, I feel like that's going to be a hot topic. And look, it's not just because it's one game against the Vancouver Canucks and both goalies gave up four goals. I felt like even last season when Stuart Skinner was playing well, there was always that sense like, oh, maybe they want to go back and circle back to Jack Campbell. And then in the playoffs, Skinner wasn't good. And Jack Campbell had some good moments in relief. But now there's that big question mark, right? Are they good enough in that? Yeah. Um, they've got Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl. They made the moves for Matias Ekholm. Like, are they good enough in that? That is going to be a very hot topic. But what can they do? The cap is what it is. They've got yeah. a big commitment to Jack Campbell. They're, they're stuck. So they're, they're, they're whole crossing their fingers and hoping. Uh, so that's a hot spot. Uh, you know what? I like to focus on positive. Like, how about Minnesota and, and Gustafson? Gustafson? Like his first wow. game, yeah. right? Like against Florida, a shutout. I think that's fantastic. A lot of last year, it was Mark andre Fleury starting the playoffs. And you're like, whoa, 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 what's going on? Gustafson's your guy. And, you know, there's there's always been that battle. I think they've got their guy now in Minnesota. Yeah. Vancouver, Thatcher Demko, if healthy. I can't wait to see where he can take the Canucks. Again, just one game against a terrible Oilers yeah. game, but that should Demko. And then the last one for me is Vegas. Like, okay, Aiden Hill did great in the playoffs last year, and everybody thought, well, yeah, anybody could have done what Aiden Hill's done. That team is loaded on defense. And then Logan Thompson, I really like. That, to me, that team, if they both roll Hill, Thompson, Hill, Thompson, they may get calls at some point and saying, yeah. hey, are you willing to let one of them go? Um, that will be interesting because I think they're going to have a great mm -hmm. season in Vegas. You brought up Philip Gustafson. I was reading an article on him, Marty, and, you know, for all the years, most of us think you guys are strange. You're, you're different people, right? Like you goalies, you're just different. <laughs> and so Philip Gustafson apparently goes to the bench and he asks guys quiz questions during the timeouts. Oh like, what are you guys doing in there? Like, do you have that much time that you can think of this stuff? <laughs> no, I mean, I if drink. I didn't even go to the bench during commercial breaks because I wanted to stay in my bubble. I remember, like, Henrik Lundqvist came back to the bench. I had to put Gatorade and water on the bench, and that was his two bottles. I had to save those two, and then he would take a little Gatorade, a little water. He'd give me a nod, and then he'd go back, right? I don't, some guys are different, yes. Um I love that though. Like Gustafson is loose enough that he can speak with everybody and have a quiz. Now, yeah. if it's going well, that's fun. But if you're down three nothing in the second, you know you're not coming back to the bench and saying, "Hey guys, uh, who is the all-time winningest?" Uh, <laughs> you know, Calgary Flames. Like, no, you're not doing that. So uh, it has to be in the right time. <laughs> uh, so it's dead. I, it, I I got to ask you because you brought up Aiden Hill and. <laughs> you know, last year certainly was terrific in the playoffs, but he wasn't even their starter in the playoffs. Laurent Brassois was till he got mm -hmm. hurt against, against the Oilers and Hill comes in. And, you know, the the pressure, it seems uh, financially on the goalie market, like there's a, a lid on it right yeah. now. Yeah. Are, are teams thinking maybe we can not spend as much money in the net and spend more on uh, 18 skaters? Or is that just kind of a, an odd circumstance that had happened with like Hill winning and Hellebuck's contract kind of at the, you know, at the max of what it was going to be. And there's a lot of different factors. I think the Sergei Bobrovsky <laughs> factor when he got 10 and a half million and Carey Price, when he got 10 and a half million was like, oh, let's see what happens. Well, it didn't really pan out, right? Carey Price got hurt and now you've got a, a goalie on long-term IR that Somebody spans somewhere. And then Sergey Bobrovsky, yeah, he had a great run in the playoffs last year, but he wasn't even the goalie at the end of the season. Yeah. So that is uh, keeping GMs very shy of spending on goaltending. And then you do have the Aiden Hill stories around the National Hockey League that make you think that you can squeeze by with a million or million and a half dollar goaltender. Now, I'll tell you this. I listened to a David Brisbois interview that he did with a, ra a radio mo uh, in Montreal in French. And they were asking him about Jonas Johansson. Why didn't you go get somebody else? And he said, there's 10 to 12 goaltenders in the NHL that you look at their, their stats, you look at their goal save above expectation, and they make a difference, right? Vasilevsky will yeah. save 35 goals a year, right? And you say, mm -hmm. that makes a difference. And then between goalie number 20 and 50, it's very similar, so he's like, mm. I don't have to go and try to pick 
somebody that's 22nd or 25th because his stats will be very similar than the guy that's 45th. So I just got to get somebody in that middle range mm -hmm. to, to keep it even until Vasilevsky comes back. And there's a lot of teams that feel that way because you could go out and spend eight and a half, nine million dollar on a top end goaltender. But if he's not in the top 10 in goal save above expectation and in, in all the metrics, then it's just a wash. He's just an average goaltender with right. somebody that's making yeah. two and a half million dollars. So that's, that's where it becomes dangerous when you focus too much on the stats. Because for me, I always think, wh who would you want in a one game, you know, hmm. do or die situation? And I want the better goalie, right? I, I, even if it's the 20th best goalie versus the 40th best goalie, I want the 20th best goalie. But that's just my yeah. thinking. I understand the numbers don't always relate that way. Ray, we'll let Marty go with this. So I do Sabres Live with Marty and Brian Duff every Thursday, right? So uh, did it on Thursday. Marty, you got to retell the story that you told. So Rick Tockett comes up after that oiler shellacking oh. there, right? And he acknowledges that Demko left the game with the flu and said, well, he puked in his, <laughs> in his, <laughs> in his mask. So, of course, I throw that at Marty Thursday on Sabres Live. And shocking or not, Marty? You had a similar experience. Yeah, it happened to me. Actually, I forgot to mention, but you guys remember J.S. Jaguar one year? Oh, yeah. Like yeah. he threw up in his net and he had <laughs> like he had to go to the Gatorade Science Center to figure out why he was becoming so dehydrated during games. Yeah. And he used to throw up all the time. Now, you know, most of the times it was in the locker room or whatnot. I played a game in Chicago. I was with the Flyers. I had, and Dregs, I didn't tell you the whole story, but okay, I had missed ahead. two weeks. I had the, I swear I had the swine flu and the swine flu was like really high. I was homesick for like two weeks and I missed like four games. And I was so upset because those were the first four games I'd ever missed in the NHL. Like I was always healthy and never injured or whatnot. And then, so we have the Christmas break. And then we fly to Chicago on December 26. And John Stevens tells me, the coach of the Flyers says, Marty, you're playing on the 26th. I know you haven't played in two weeks, but let's get going. You play on the 26th. Well, we missed the morning skate because there was a disabled plane on the, uh, on the runway at uh, O'Hare. So we had to go to the other midway and whatever. We missed the morning skate in Chicago. We get to the game at night. I like exhausted myself in warm up. Because I hadn't played in two weeks. I'm making all the saves. I'm Dominic Ashik in warm-ups. And I'm like, I'm so exhausted. In the locker room between warm-up and the game, I'm like, I'm going to be sick. Like, oh. I just felt like I just came off the VO2 max or the wind gate, right? Like, <laughs> running the bike or whatnot. I'm like, I'm going to be sick. No, no, just breathe. You're going to be okay. I end up going on the ice for the national anthem. And then during the national anthem, I'm like, I'm going to be sick. I'm going to be sick. <laughs> I'm going to be sick. Hold it, hold it. And then I'm like, national anthem's over. I put my mask on. And as I put my mask on, I'm like, bloop, bloop. And I'm like just, just a little bit. It's gross. I get it, people. I'm sorry. But you but haven't even started the game. I yet. haven't yeah. even started the game. And now I could, guys, not proud of that moment either. But I'm like, now you could start to smell. It smells like throw Ew. up. Like it's just <laughs> you. The game hasn't even started yet. So I played the first period. And I'm like using the water bottle, trying to spray it all off and wash it all off. And I got back to the locker room after the first. And I remember going to, to oh. Nasty and Bricks. And I'm like, can you guys wash this? And they're like, oh, what that? <laughs> I'm like, it happened early in the period. And they're like, well, next time come to the bench. We have multiple jerseys. We could have gotten you a new jersey at least or whatnot. I'm like, I didn't know that. But yeah, it was oh. not good. We lost that game. Uh, no, yeah, yeah, I wasn't good in that game either, but yeah, that happened and I wasn't really, uh, fit to play. Let's just say. That's, that's a tough one to top, Ray. That's a tough one to this, top. That's a, that's a gold medal winner right there. <laughs> the Primary toi, Marty, the Primary toi. <laughs> yeah, no, that wasn't, you know, who was the goalie that used to throw up before every game? Was that Sawchuck oh. or Glenn Hall? Glenn Hall. Yeah, Glenn he played Hall, 508 yeah. straight games. And he had to throw up before every game. Like, I'm like, yeah. at some point, your body's just, dude, stop. Yeah. Get over like, I can't do yeah. that. <laughs> You're the best, Marty. Thanks for joining us. Hey, you guys are the best. Thank you. Take care, Marty.
All right. A reminder, ask Ray and Dregs anything. You can send our quest- send your questions our way to us on Twitter and Instagram at Ray and Dregs or on the website. Check us out there, rayanddregs.com. Randine Rashad Ray feverishly compiling a flood of questions for next week's Ray and Dregs. So oh. by choice, we're just, you know, we're going to let it breathe a little bit. It's I like busy, it. a bit busy episode. Episode six has been a busy one. I like it. I like it. And and it's a good thing it's Randine doing it, not Ryan, because right. yeah. you know, we know how that would go. Yeah. Uh, we'd be getting questions from like last year. Or worse, he, he'd make them up. You know, it's Bob Shortnose from <laughs> Kelowna <laughs> wants to know. <laughs> we, need to, we need to keep him right back there he's got his own pod to worry about he does all right buddy so you got the caps tonight and the penguiners yep. um and then what quick flight back to to uh vancouver in the morning and catch a couple of soccer games with the young yep. lads i trust yeah cup yep got soccer saturday and then uh we'll certainly watch um you know watch canucks and the oilers rematch for sure you know yep. they're in edmonton on saturday um, kind of catch up at home and then back on the road uh, Monday um, down to Seattle. Yeah. Uh, we're, so I got Colorado, Seattle, and then Chicago, Colorado next week. Okay. And uh, those are those are my couple games, Tuesday, Thursday, next week. What do you got this weekend? Uh, actually heading to a buddy's cottage in Muskoka. Um, every year I lend a hand. We have to pull in the docks, right? You know, you can't leave them out there. They'll freeze in there. It'll be a disaster. So... Going to the Doyle Brothers Cottage and uh, going to do a little bit. Now, of are that. you a helper or are you uh, like a supervisor? Well, normally I'm a I'm a bit of a supervisor or you know a, a beverage supplier. Let's let's leave it at that. Mm, yeah, yeah. Uh, however, Phil Potra, so Matt Potra's dad, is normally the guy who jumps into the lake and pulls the pins and does all the grunt work. Right? He's not coming because he's going to the Boston Nashville game on Saturday game two for his son. I mean, imagine that, you know, yeah. missing out this weekend where he should be helping his buddies to go watch his son play in his second yeah. NHL game. What what a tough decision. I'm sure it was. For him. <laughs> anyway, so chances are I'm getting wet, but I'll keep you posted on that. I'd like to see that. Tuesday. I'd like, I'd like to see the <laughs> abilities. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm going to put I know I water wings on, you know, I'm, a, yeah. you know, just, I'm not as nimble in the water as I once was, Ray. <laughs> All right, buddy. Well, look after yourself, fun. man. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening, everybody. And thanks to our sponsors who continue to support Ray and Dregs. Our title sponsor, Canadian Club Whiskey and Tim Hortons. Thank you. As always, thanks to you for listening. Rate us, share the podcast, and follow us on the Ray and Dregs YouTube channel. Until next time, everybody, stay safe.